Welcome back to the Sync My Music podcast. I have another great uh, guest interview for you guys today. This is Mike Gennato, and Mike is also another one of our Sync Academy pros on the platform. So he's been supplying us every single month, actually, with a lot of really valuable and very useful tutorials. Everything from how to produce, mix, and master tracks, but also a lot of the business aspects in terms of how to understand uh, what a music library does, what their company structure looks like, so they can really empathize and understand what it's like to be on that side, that side of the equation. And the reason why Mike can provide that um, guidance and that insight that's very unique is because he's also been on both sides of the equation. He started off in this industry actually before I even got into it, so he's actually a, a, a longer veteran of this business than I am. Um, and But he decided a few years back to start the transition from only producing and submitting to libraries and, and supervisors and catalogs to actually building his own boutique music library and catalog so that now he is directly pitching to clients and going that route. So I know a lot of you guys listening to this podcast probably have that question. And maybe if you're getting started just now, um, I don't think it's something you should be doing within the first couple of years of your career. So let me just put that right out there. It is a lot of work. It's a lot of investment of time, resources, and money to be able to do that. And I think just like everything else, I think you need to really get a ground level understanding of producing and creating licensable tracks. Because if you don't know how to necessarily do it yourself and you don't have a track record yourself of doing that, how are you going to be able to recognize that talent and bring that on board to your company when you build your catalog or um, a company in the future, right? So I just want to make sure you guys have that disclaimer before we get started with this. But it's absolutely um, a, a something that's in your future if you want it to be. It certainly can be something you can do, you can strive forward uh, within the next maybe five or ten years to build up to the point where you can create your own boutique library or catalog. So in this interview, we're going to talk a little bit about Mike's history, starting out in the industry, where he was when he f first got started, as well as what made him decide to take that next leap, that next jump up to create a catalog or a library. I personally have not done that because I just don't have any interest in doing it. I love just making music. I love uh, educating you guys, putting out this kind of content. So that's where my heart is. That's what I love to do. But uh, Mike found that he really loved this side of the business of actually creating and curating clients and directly pitching his music in his catalog. So let's dive right into it, Mike. Thank you so much for joining us, man. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and let everybody know where you came from in this business. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, so, yeah, again, my name is Mike Gennato. I've been a composer for a long time uh, for picture. I actually started um, with a video game project way, way, way back in 1994. Um, I was like 14, I think. And at the time, I was living in Pittsburgh, PA. And uh, it was kind of a fluke kind of thing because, like, um, you know, for any of those you know, any of you real like nerdy like um, computer heads from back in the day, like I was into this thing called like the demo scene, and it really only happened like in Finland and stuff where it was really these like uh, coder groups um, that was creating these um, pretty cool and intense uh, animations, usually using like um, old PCs and Amiga computers, but all just like machine code. And I had gotten into that because the music sounded, you know, it was digital and it was like, and it uses it used this uh, format called mod um, tracking that was accessible to me at the time. You know, I didn't have any gear. I didn't know anything about MIDI, you know, and I always thought that I had ideas, but I just never had any way of putting it down. So a friend of mine was just like, yo, you should check this out. It's just a piece of software, you know, and just use a sample. So that was my first foray into actually making music. And then shortly after that, well, shortly in the sense of like maybe a year after finding that piece of software and playing with it. But, you know, it, I was probably on that thing like you know, 26 hours a day, <laughs> you know, like, so of course, like I learned how to use it pretty quickly. Um, but anyway, yeah, I wanted to create my own in animations and stuff like that. And I didn't really know anything about graphics or coding. I found some guys like locally uh, in my town and was just told them what I was interested in. They're like, oh, well, we actually formed a video game company and we need music. So your stuff is cool. Let's just get together and try to do this. Of course, you know, that was my first foray into composing, getting a job as a composer and all that kind of stuff. I had no idea what was going on. You know, I'd signed contract. I'm sure I signed like, you know, parts of my soul away and stuff like that. Like, you know, so <laughs> I had no idea. Like I was 14, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. Like, you know, I had to get my parents involved because like I wasn't legally able to like really sign any contracts, you know, then either. So. Um, so that's how that started, and that really piqued my interest as far as writing music to picture. And I always, from that point on, I always wanted to be like a film score or actually like a game score. But back then, you know, there was no like 
video games back then is not the way it is now. You know, it's like it, they weren't really that cinematic and it was just like, you know, it was really hard to get into. Um, and there's no schools that was teaching it or anything like that. So when it came time for me to go to college, I decided to move to New York and um, kind of immerse myself in audio engineering and stuff like that. And, you know, people there just kind of told me, it's like, okay, well, if you want to get to film, you probably should start in TV, you know. Um, and in New York, it's all commercials. So that's kind of how I started. Um, I was just basically a studio rat at one of the uh, music houses um, in New York, and they did all the commercials, like Intel commercials, like all the old like Nokia commercials and all that kind of stuff. So I got to see like you know the way that worked as far as having um, you know staff composers, freelance composers, and you know mix engineer and all the meetings and all that kind of stuff. And it was a really interesting thing for me because I had no idea that like. You know, first off, the music for the commercials was cool. You know, um, some of those guys that um, I remember working with ended up being um, so I didn't even know this at the time, but I found out later that, like, you know, guys that were there as composers or even just as admin people, like, um, um, uh, who's it, like Daedalus, <laughs> you know, was working there. Um, guys like um, uh, Glitch Mob also uh, was working there too. So I was like, you know, these are artists that became like big artists that, you know, became, that had big careers like afterwards and doing like really cool stuff and starting the same like sort of commercial music house and they were doing cool stuff. And I was like, you know, so that really piqued my interest into like, you know, and at that time there was really licensing, music licensing wasn't really established in the, in the way of like libraries and production music is now, you know? So I think at the time I started, that was like the first, um, that was when like Daft Punk got that Nokia commercial and Moby licensed that entire album. That was like, then it made like huge waves to where, you know, jingle music was starting to change and it wasn't going to, it wasn't jingles anymore. And they were using real artists and now indie artists, you know, cause at that time Moby was an indie artist. So same as Daft Punk, they were both underground, you know, so that gave an avenue for their careers, you know, to actually get their music out there when, you know, of course, like, you know, they couldn't get on the radio, especially in, in America, you know? So that's kind of how I started. Um, from there, just like kind of worked my tail off, signed a lot of bad deals, signed some good deals, um, you know, and yeah, just kind of got into both composing um, for picture, like custom, and also into the library side too. So the funny thing was I didn't actually take music libraries seriously until maybe about four years ago or five years ago, you know? So like at first, and, and you know, this is, this is a story I, I tell all the time, but like at first, um, so one of the first music libraries I had found um, was actually InGroove's Music. And if you know anything about InGroove's Music, now they are a major, major publisher and, um, and distributor, music distributor. You know, they do major artists and everything now. But back then, I just, I'd seen a listing. I think I was like um, getting emails or I, I was getting the listings from like filmmusic.net or something like that. You know, they had those directories. And I saw their, their name and they had a listing of like, hey, you know, we need some, we're you know, doing stuff for picture, we need some tracks, send some stuff over. They took like 20 tracks of mine. Um, one of them became like an MTV sort of compilation album, which was kind of cool, but I had no idea that that was gonna happen. And a bunch of them went to like uh, reality shows like Real World and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. But of course it was like, I was like, yeah, whatever, you know, new company, I didn't take it seriously. You know, I just like kind of gave them my throwaways. You know, after a while, I think, I found out later I had fallen off like, you know, communication, like, you know, and I found out later that like, I think InGroove's got bought or no, I think they got bought by either Universal or someone big like that. And then they ended up buying um, what was then a small company called Position Music. <laughs> so, you know, as their like licensing arm kind of thing. And so I was like, of course, when I found that, I was like kicking myself. I was like, oh man, if I just like stuck around with that, you know, I could have stuff in that whole system, you know, like right from the ground up. But, you know, you, you, you kind of learn as you go. So that's kind of how I started. And yeah, just been, you know, I love writing the picture. I love writing music in general. And I think writing the picture has just kind of given me, you know, it, first off, not only has it just given me an opportunity to just always write music, you know, I started out as an electronic producer and, you know, and writing actually you know, as an artist, I started out as, as a drum and bass artist and, um, you know, when I got involved in doing stuff for picture, I learned how to do hip hop. I learned how to do funk. I learned how to do some types of jazz, you know, and now orchestral and trailer music and stuff is, you know, kind of what I do now. So, 
it's great. Like, uh, you know, all the years that I've, I've spent there, it's just kind of forced me to learn that because, you know, jobs come in, they need music, you know, like you can't, you can't say no, you know, uh, you could say no, but then you're just not involved anymore, <laughs> you know? So if you want to do it, you just say, yes, you can do it. And then you just try to do it. Like, you know, yeah. and it's so interesting. Uh, <clears throat> so interesting about your story there is that uh, you and I both kind of got into it. I obviously started off just with music libraries. That was my uh, introduction into this entire industry. So it's so interesting that you completely didn't go through music libraries in the very beginning. Um, but I think what we were both similar on is that we had no idea what we were getting ourselves involved with, really <laughs> didn't know the sort of full scope <clears throat> of the power what this industry could really bring. It's one of my big regrets, actually, the first couple of years that I was in this business is I didn't take it seriously enough. I just kind of dabbled in it. Um, I was producing music fairly consistently for it, but I didn't have this vision of like, this could be my full-time gig. It wasn't until I started seeing some of the money, some of the royalties, some of that stuff kind of come in that I was really realizing that if I really hustle at this and I really give it 100%, I could actually really turn this into my full-time uh, day gig and I never have to go get a day job or work uh, to work for somebody else and make somebody else um, rich. I could really work for myself. It doesn't mean I don't work for clients and it doesn't mean I don't serve the needs of other people. That's absolutely what I do and what you do, Mike, um, obviously every single day in this business. But it is kind of interesting that you, know, you go back 10, 15 years there was just nothing like this. There were certainly no mm -hmm. podcasts. There were no YouTube channels. There were no yeah. courses. There was nothing out there at all. Yeah. Uh, most producers, even major label artists, didn't even know that they could be monetizing their music <clears throat> on this side of the industry. So let's, you know, we're kind of in the middle of your career there. You're regularly contributing to music. You're maybe reaching out to libraries, that kind of a thing. So walk me through your mindset of where you were at that point when you started to get that little kind of nugget of an idea going that maybe I should create my own boutique music library. Maybe I should actually start to attract clients and go to that next level. Um, you know, what were some of your hesitations before going on to that? Mm -hmm. What was it that attracted you about that? Where were you when you decided to make that big switch in your career? Yeah, okay, so um, most of it just comes down to, <clears throat> I think, my personality, um, just as a person. So um, basically, if, you know, if we step back a little bit, the way I've always been, I've always been, you know, musically, I've always been into underground music. I've always been into independent music. You know, I ran an independent label, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and I signed stuff to other labels and stuff, too, but, like, it was never an interest for me to pursue... Um, like that major label deal or anything like that, you know, um, mostly because my attitude was always like, well, I, I always felt like it's the same amount of work, you know, and, you know, it's kind of just like if I'm putting in the work, I'd rather just invest it all into myself, you know, and I'll have full control whether like, you know, if I succeed or if I don't kind of <clears> thing <throat> rather than leaving it up to somebody else, you know. So that's part of like, you know, that's one part of my personality. The other part is that every time I've worked with a new company or whatever, you know, I always worked hard and I always tried to um, keep a level, like, you know, almost build a level of friendship, you know, like I, I've, I realized that, you know, you're kind of dealing with people too. And after a while, you know, I, and I've done this, I've done it both ways, you know, with, with various companies, some companies, it's like, you can't really get to know, you know, and I noticed that like those relationships, I haven't really lasted very long on, on either side, you know, it's like they wouldn't call me or I would just like, they would just fall off my radar too. You know, so but the ones that like I would start to have a rapport, like either with a producer or with a creative director and stuff like that, I ended up becoming friends. So one of the first companies I was working with, um, I got on with them at a good time because they were building, too. And um, they used to do things like go down to the Winter Music Conference in Miami and, you know, do all these kind of other events, you know. And because I was like friends with everyone, you know, I'd, sometimes I'd ask them, but other times they just invite me and be like, hey, you want to come? You know, so in just by going to those events, you know, I would meet their clients, I would meet other people, you know, and just on a friendly level, you know, and most of the time, you know, I would never be like, okay, like do with some backroom deal, <laughs> you know, where it's like, hey, yo, just hit me up directly. But at the same time, I, I would talk to some people and, you know, keep so over time, what ended up happening was um, as those people started to work and move around the industry in different companies as like the company I was working with. Um, I think they eventually closed, um, you know, stuff like that. When, when those kind of changes happen, um, next thing you know, I start getting some emails. I start getting contacts from those, from those friends and those people. I've, and it's not very many, you know, um, but it was all kind of just like, Hey, you know, do you have anything for this? Do you, you know, can you help us out with this? You know? And a lot of times I just felt like, I'm um, sorry, like my tracks are just tied up here and there, you know, and that's what put the idea in my head of like, okay, well, 
you know, I would like to have at least a portion of what, of something to be able to offer them because yes, I mean, the, the cut is higher, you know, I don't have to go through anyone else. Um, so that's kind of what put it in my head. And then from there, um, at another company that I was working at as a composer, sometimes they would bring me in because of my relationship with them. When the creative director would go away on vacation and stuff like that, sometimes they'd bring me in and ha and have me act as their creative director for um, their composers. And uh, I actually really enjoyed doing that. Um, I enjoyed putting together the pitches for the clients. I enjoyed like coming up with um, all the creative ideas to pitch to the clients and also to you know direct the composer as to what they needed to do. So. You know, that coupled with the fact that I started to get some people already hitting me up for music directly, you know, it just kind of made sense. Um, of course, like, as I went into it, then I started to find out, like, all the other things that had to go into it, you know. And, but hasn't really deterred me, you know. Like, there are definitely times where it's just like, eh, I don't know if this is, you know, because, like, uh, you know, especially when you look around at your competition or you look around at, like, the rest of the industry, it's just like, oh, okay, I'm going up against, like, you know, teams of like hundreds of people, like these are, some of these are major corporations that are doing this, you know, and I'm like one guy, eventually two guys, you know, it's like, it's kind of like, I'm like the little visual anti out of there, you know, like just like doing stuff like at night, like on my own trying to, you know, trying to break in, but you know, so it's hard, but like, you know, it's definitely fulfilling and you know, it's, 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 you know, to, to make that transition was more of just, like I said, it was, it came out of necessity, but then also like it just fed my own personality of just like, hey, I think I can do this myself. Um, let's try it. So, yeah, it makes perfect sense that if you're getting a demand from the marketplace, from your clients and they're asking you, and it's definitely happened to me in my career, you know, some libraries or people just I know, you know, through yeah. whatever network that I've sort of created <clears throat> over the years, ask for some kinds of music, particular kinds of music. And if I just don't have it, I, I, I totally understand what that feels like where you're like, damn, I wish I, you know, I always, I always <laughs> tell them, listen, if it's an opportunity I want to obviously go for, it. I'll say, give me a couple of days. I'll get you something. Sometimes yeah. though, it's like, nah, we need it yesterday. Like we need it right now. We need something yeah. that's already created, already ready to go. We don't have time to kind of hold hands and, and try to get this new track placed uh, or, or created. So I totally get that. So it seems like in your career, you were getting a lot of those kind of requests and enough of the opportunities were stacking up where you were missing out every time mm -hmm. they asked for something and you couldn't actually provide for it. So there are two ways to address that. And one is obviously what you've done, which is where you basically created an entire company around it. You brought in a partner, obviously, to, to help you with that. And so you guys obviously built up an entire brand and a website and an online catalog and just all the stuff you guys have done. Uh, the other thing for those of you guys that are listening, though, that maybe don't want to go through the entire building of a, of a whole library or a catalog um, is just always be creating music, okay? So even if your library that you're working with currently, it doesn't need anything right now from you, there is no excuse to not be always creating new music. So if there is a, a certain type of music that you, you're starting to see that's in, in, uh, that's in demand out there, you're hearing a lot of a certain kind of music in the type of shows that your library pitches for you, right? Like if it's a reality show, something like that, or even just the, the, the genre that you really specialize in. Like let's say you've already done a couple of albums of dramedy cues, which is like hip hop and orchestral mix, but kind of lighthearted and fun, quirky even. There's no reason why you shouldn't be always creating new music and always have a back catalog of music that you can always shop and offer to anybody for any particular opportunity because worst case scenario, nobody comes to you and they don't want any of the music that you've been storing kind of on your hard drive. Well, if you're creating full albums that are themed properly, and we have obviously those tutorials in Sync Academy for how to theme an album and put them together, and you've got like an, a group of eight to 10 or 12 of them, you've got a full album ready to go. So you can always submit that entire album to the library that you're currently partnered with. Or maybe if you want to sort of kick in the door with a brand new library, you've got a full album ready to go. So if you're going to call yourself a music licensing producer, you better be producing music all the time, every single day, I think, at least getting some idea out, some sort of a sketch out there on your DAW and always be creating music so that if those opportunities do come across your, uh, your desk and your email inbox, you at least have a fighting chance to maybe uh, fulfill them. So you, you mentioned there that getting into this new um, uh, business model started to provide some new obstacles and some new things that you weren't aware of. Can you actually dive into what some of those maybe tricky parts of starting a library were for you? Yeah, so the biggest thing was um, I always had the idea. I still have it now. I, I keep a very close, pay very close attention to <clears throat> keeping the operation boutique, you know, keeping it niche. And I always wanted to kind of create this... Um, very focused 
sort of direction for the company and for, you know, the style of music and stuff like that, you know. And essentially the way it started was just like to have an avenue for the music that I do. Um, again, you know, met, met up with my uh, current business partner. He made music too. And that was basically where, you know, we came together. We were just like, okay, you know, let's just, it much in the same way of like creating an indie label, you know, it's like we have a platform now to put our music out. Well, what I found was that, um, so I might, let's say like, you know, we're really into like synth stuff and like cyberpunk stuff, you know, and we're like, okay, great. Let's do all the cyberpunk music. And it's awesome, you know, like, and we start sending it out. And what I found was just that it's hard to take one style of music and try to figure out, because like, you know, now what you need to do is you now you need to match that with whatever supervisor, editor, or client out there that's working on that kind of project, you know? And there's so many projects being worked on at the same time by so many different people that you don't, that's the challenge. You don't necessarily know who's working on what, you know? So maybe I think like, you know, with a bigger staff and stuff like that, um, sometimes you can get word as to, okay, well, this is happening by this company. And then maybe you can quickly make something for that, you know? But um, in the beginning, when you just have a catalog of stuff, you know, you have to be able to kind of hit the time, either hit the timing perfectly, which is almost impossible to do, or have a wider, um, a wider range of stuff to be able to, you know, when a request comes in, it's like, hey, listen, we need like some really, you know, like I said, we're doing, when we started doing the trailer kind of stuff too, like it was a lot of sci-fi and a lot of like a uh, cyberpunk type of stuff um, at that time you know, like Ghost in the Shell was coming out, uh, Blade Runner 2049 was coming out, you know, those kinds of movies. So that's, those, those are the kinds of things we wanted to hit. But then the request that we were getting was like, hey, we need like a custom overlay for this Jay-Z team, or we need like um, a cover of, you know, a Rolling Stone song, you know? And we're like, yes, we'll do it, <laughs> you know? But like, and then it's a scramble of like, okay, what do we have? Can we even do this? Do we, you know, who can we call to get it done? And so that was like the biggest eye opener for us is like, oh, wait, we got to come ready for this kind of stuff. We have to have a plan as to what kinds of albums we need to, to produce, um, when to produce them, too. Because the thing is, like, yeah, we all know Christmas season is coming up and stuff like that. But it's just like if I were to start now to produce a Christmas album, by the time it's done, all the Christmas ads are over, you know, so it's like. You know, you kind of have to plan it out, um, especially like when it comes to movie trailers, you're looking at trailers sometimes coming out like eight, sometimes 12 months out, you know. So that was another big obstacle is to like try to figure out what the timing was, you know, of everything and then trying to hit that. So I think oh, it, it takes time, you know, so it took us definitely a couple of years just to figure out that. And then the other thing, too, is just um, bouncing back and forth between production and sales is really challenging um you know the good thing is i don't think that like you know there isn't as much of an emphasis nowadays as far as whining and dining clients you know i think clients <laughs> want to just be able to get their work done you know um so that's great i don't have to like have a huge budget of like a thousand bucks every single week just to take people out you know and you know for like spa days or some shit like that but like you know um so that's good but at the same time it's like you know I found that it's it can be done, but it's a little bit hard to like go from like three weeks of selling and then, OK, now I got to step into production mode for like three weeks and then come back, you know. And what I found is that like that's good to do for new releases. But the thing is, when you're trying to make new contacts and stuff like that, everything that you've done is new to them, you know. So it's kind of like you have to find time to somewhere constantly being, you know, able to make new connections and stuff like that. And like I said, we're boutique. We're, you know, I, I, I pride myself on trying to keep it that way. So I'm not necessarily looking for like 50 or 100 clients like right off the bat. You know, I'm looking for like five good ones that'll keep coming back kind of thing. Turn that into 10, turn that into 50, you know, and, and scale in the way that we can, you know. Um, so like, you know, so we're not like just like, mass emailing everybody you know we're not just like spamming everybody we're not just being like oh hey i see that you edit like or <laughs> you like trailers hey we do music you know what i mean like and and you know, people see right through that too especially like um the companies that you know in advertising there's a lot of money that goes around that you know so there's a lot of people that want to try to get at that money you know so there's a lot of that a lot of those types of people that when you're on the other side, you can see right through that like really easily. And, um, you know, it's, it's that tough game of 
you know, really trying to be personable, trying to be professional, while still also being confident about what you're offering and offering it too, without it being like, okay, yeah, you know what, you're just the next person on the list, you know? And what I think so. is really interesting about all of that is how just identically that mirrors how a producer should be approaching this business because you and your partner started looking around realizing you know you can't be all things to all people and you guys got some great music and you have great skills between the two of you but you started looking and going wow there's a lot of competition out here there's a lot of projects like where do we fit you know we can't mm -hmm. be all things to all people so i think the smart move you guys made and it's obviously paying off because you guys are doing some great projects now is you really niche down you and like you said you didn't try to get a thousand clients immediately you wanted to really zero in on what's the one thing or a couple of things that your library can really provide that can really help serve the needs of a particular type of content provider or producer. And it's the exact same thing when you are a music producer or a composer yeah. trying to partner on the other side of that with a library. Um, same thing, you don't wanna you know, copy and paste 300 emails into your email to field and just spam it all out there and just <laughs> hope, well, I can make, and I, and I get this all the time, Producers always tell me, well, Jesse, I can produce eight different styles of music, so I don't think I should be limiting myself by just being one one style of producer. And I say, best of luck. If you really feel that way, I'm not going to stop you. You can do whatever you want to do. But usually libraries understand the same thing that I understand, the same thing that Mike understood as he got his business started. You can't be all things to all people. You can't be a jack of all trades. You're going to be a master of none of them. You're going to be adequate or average at best at all of them. The industry requires that you become specialized if you really want to thrive. Um, and it's just a concept you're going to have to get used to, especially in, in any business you really want to get into. You want to find one niche that you can really exploit, that you can really uh, dive in and serve those needs better than anybody else and just crank away at that one niche. And like Mike said, you, you start with a small client list and as a music producer or composer, that's one library, like one singular mm -hmm. one. You can submit to 10 libraries, have nine of them say no to you and you only succeed 10% of the time, but that's how you can get your start in this business. So it doesn't require you get a lot of yeses actually to get into it. But understanding yourself, understanding what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, um, and really zeroing, zeroing in on that one strength that you have and trying to serve a, a particular singular niche, um, especially for producers, that's usually in one style of music. And with uh, with Mike and his partner and their company, they obviously figured out the one type of track. Uh, not they have, I know they have multiple genres, but the one style uh, of music that really can um, um, sort of pitch directly to these particular clients that they found really need uh, their music. And so they really found that and that's why they're starting to grow. And you don't expect success overnight, of course, and you know that's gonna be a long-term process. So obviously you're seeing that. Um, so. I want to maybe just finish off this interview with, because uh, we didn't even get into creating the website, getting the catalog, dealing with paperwork, clearing music mm -hmm. from the composers that you work with. Um, yeah. You know, that we have actually an entire tutorial in Sync Academy covering all of those topics, so we're not going to get into that on this podcast. But maybe if you could, um, if you were talking to a producer right now who might be four to five, six years into their career, um, and they're thinking about taking that next step to do what you have done. What would be some things that you wish you would have heard before you started your, your company that would have uh, definitely prepared you a little bit better to get started? And also, importantly, who should not do this at all? Like, what kind of a producer or composer do you think should really just not bother and not even go down this path where it probably wouldn't be a good move for them? Yeah, all right. Yeah, to answer your first question, um, I think the first thing that I would say to any <clears throat> producer that would look to open up a library is, you know, the first question I would ask them is, well, what kind of projects do you want to do, you know? And essentially listen closely to that answer. And if they tell me, it's like, no, I just want to start a music library and I'll take whatever comes in. Like, <laughs> like no, you're going to, like, that's going to fail. Like, really, you know, and, and I'm not saying this, I'm, I'm saying this through experience because that's what we did <laughs> actually in the beginning, you know? So we started off uh, with a job. We actually got a job with NBC before we were officially created. And, um, and it was to create, like, uh, essentially 100 tracks for their um, TV promos and stuff like that to use as episodic uh, trailers and stuff like that for all their shows across all their networks, you know, so we got a lot of things on Sci-Fi Channel and stuff like that too. Um, but so that started us down the path and then we were thinking like, oh, cool, let's make this. So we started these 100 tracks. Let's just keep going and make more music and then we can place them in, you know, reality shows need a lot of music. Um, 
you know, like we can do themes, we can do video, we like video games, yeah, let's do that, like, you know, and then we're also just like, oh, wait, we're also good engineers, so let's do that too, and, you know, so we try to be this all-in-one sort of house and try to be, like, sort of welcoming to everybody, it's like, hey, come through, come, come to our store, you know, it's like you're trying to be Walmart or whatever, you know, <laughs> and it's like, and it didn't work because what ended up happening was that, um, first off, unlike Walmart, we don't have everything in our store, <laughs> you know, like we only have what we have, you know, and we didn't have the resources to go out and acquire everything. And we didn't even want to, you know, so there's a lot of music that we just don't even want to want to represent and want to do. Secondly, it's like, okay, yeah, we can do things like for reality shows and stuff like that. But then you have to ask yourself like, well, do we know anybody that that's making reality shows? Like, no, like I've the only reality shows that I've ever gotten my music into was through another library who already had contacts in there. So I didn't have those contacts. Um, the con the contacts that I had was in advertising. So after a while, you know, and like I said, we got caught doing a lot of mixing indie films. Like we got a really big contract actually with Netflix doing a lot of like foreign language mixing, which is great, but that took away a year almost of us making music, you know. So in a sense, like, and I think I've told you this before, but um. It, we're, it's almost like this past May, we kind of rebranded and relaunched as a music company. But I kind of look at this, even though that we officially opened our doors in 2016, I look at this past May as our actual opening of the company, you know, because this is now we're focused as to what we got to do. So that'd be the first thing I would tell, tell everybody is like, hey, you really got to have a really like laser focus as to what it is that you want to do. If you want to make trailer music, if you want to do trailers, go do trailers and make the most badass trailer music out there you know like if you want to you know if you want to do like if you want to or even within trailer music if you want to do hybrid stuff to where it's just like oh you know what'd be cool is if like let's take songs let's do songs for trailers we'll study that figure out how that's done figure out how you could put your stamp on it and make that mark you know um and then just do that because the thing about it is there's enough money around that you know once you kind of get rolling with like, let's say one or two jobs it can pay for the next one. It can pay for, like, you know, like you just, you know, starting small isn't necessarily starting from scratch, you know, here. So you can really focus in. And I would, the other thing I would tell, um, you know, after that, uh, the next the next part of the process is like now you got to, now what you got to do is you got to think about um, all the stuff that you need. So think about all the legalities and stuff like that. Like what kind of a company are you going to be? Are you going to start an LLC? You know, what are the costs in your state to uh, operate an LLC? What's all the paperwork? Are you going to go through legal zoom? Are you going to do it yourself? You know, how do you want to do it? You know, um, how are you going to pay people? Are you going to, are you going to, you know, get a QuickBooks account for your account? You know what I mean? This is all stuff that, you know, now you got to start thinking about it as a business, you know, like put music down for a second, you know, and think about like every, so even with me and my partner, one of the first conversations that we had, like, and we are really good friends, you know, we both have families and, you know, our kids hang out with each other and everything like that. They're like best friends. But like the very first thing that we did was like, hey, if this goes south, what happens to the money and what happens between us? You know, and we got that in writing. We got that, you know, and I think that was part of the reason why he, you know, we decided to go into business together because we kind of looked at this the same way in the sense of like, well, yeah, we're friends, but we don't want to leave anything in a gray area as friends, you know, like we figured that's going to ruin our friendship later, you know, if things like don't happen or whatever the case is, or, you know, so let's get our contract in writing. So get our details down as to like, okay, how, how are things going to happen? We get successful. How's the money split? What do you think is fair? And, you know, and get it all in writing. We sign it. That way it's like after day one, we shake hands and it's like, okay, great. We now know it's like, we're business partners now. Like we don't have to focus on that anymore. We can now just be friends, you know? And um, so that's the one thing. And then everything else is just like, like I said, you have to think about branding. You got to think about um, um, marketing in the sense of, and not necessarily in the sense of like, okay, well, how much money do I need to um, put out ads or anything? You know, you can do that in some companies uh, can do. I think I remember when uh, Alibi started um, years ago. I just remember that like part of how they um, got everywhere was they just they got ads everywhere, like on Facebook, YouTube, like it was just everywhere. Every single week, I just kept seeing, you know, like, you know, share your story, whatever their tagline was, you know, like alibi music. And now they're freaking huge. But like, 
you know, I just remember when they were starting, they were doing two things. So I had actually, um, as a composer, to approach them before um, to kind of put some stuff into a library. I, I botched that contract, by the way. But anyway, um, so, but I did get a good look as to like, you know, so they were doing it on two fronts in the sense of like, okay, as they're acquiring music, they're also going out there and telling everybody that they had music too. So that's one strategy. You know, another strategy is you can have everything that you need first and then go out and sell it as a catalog. But whatever it is that works for you, you have to think about those things. And then you have to come up with a plan. So um, one thing that we didn't do in the fir in our first run either was we were just like, OK, yeah, you know, this is all creative. When we get an album out, let's get it out. And then you know, we'll shop it. You know, let's not hinder the creative process, right? Well, problem with that is like, if you don't put any deadlines on anything, then nothing gets done. So <laughs> that's one thing we learned. So we had a goal this year of actually being like, hey, let's do six albums this year. That's one every two months. You know, um, and then we started thinking about it's like, well, as somebody new, so this is how we've kind of formed our own niche in the sense too, or another way that we formed our own niche. We also felt that like the way we've been pitching stuff to our clients, they were never expecting us to um, send 20 tracks, 30 tracks, you know, in large numbers kind of thing. And we never, we never went about it that way in the past anyway. We, you know, we're always just like, okay, whatever it is that you need, we will be hyper-focused and try to get you those four tracks or five tracks that really hit your brief. You know, maybe one extra that does a little something different, but we're not just going to send you, we're not just going to throw everything at the wall and see what sticks kind of thing. We were never that. So um, for us, that translated to, well, instead of doing full 10, 15, 20 track albums, let's just do like six, eight track EPs, you know, and at least in the beginning, we can widen our uh, genre um, base and all that kind of stuff too. So what started out as a six album sort of, um, um, goal for the year, I think we're now at, from May to now, I think we have 12, I think, albums with another four on the slate that we can get done by the end of uh, December, which to me is great. Like, I think that's, you know, and all the genres that we want to do. So now, and with this being a good time, you know, you also have to think about like, well, what is the timing and everything? Well, this is about the time where companies start to figure out their budgets for the next year. Right. So we're brand new. So now we can have those conversations with ammo behind us. Be like, hey, you know, we're a new vendor. We can provide music and stuff like that. You know, and as they're looking for new vendors, because companies are looking for new people to work with all the time, you know, like uh, sometimes they may have other relationships that work out great. Sometimes they have the longstanding ones, but then they also want to try something fresh or they might need to replace a couple of relationships, you know, like maybe some price them out, whatever the case is, you know, so we're just trying to position ourselves for that. Um, so that's the biggest thing that, um, I would say as far as like, if you're starting out, you have to have all the logistics together, you know, and all that logistics also comes in play in the sense of like, what's your team going to be, you know, like, do you, can you do this yourself? I'm going to say no, <laughs> cause I've tried, but, uh, you need at least one other person. And technically we have four, uh, because we have two salespeople that's kind of working with us non-exclusively. So, um, we have little deals like that, that help us around. Um, we've actually just signed another deal with um, a company that's going to help us um, chase down royalties for commercials and stuff like that, too, because that's really hard to do. Um, and especially, you know, we have to sell, we have to create. So that's just too much time. So we're OK with giving a percentage of something in order to, you know, if anyone knows about trying to hound uh, royalties for commercials, a lot of times you just don't get it. So if we see it as a bonus anyway, that's fine that they can take their cut. Um, so stuff like that. I know I kind of went on like uh, a little bit more. So what, what was your second question again? I'm no, sorry. that was it, man. I mean, basically <laughs> the other one was like, who would you tell to uh, they, they definitely not do this? Like what kind of a composer uh, would you see uh, if you if you met them and they said, hey, I want to do this. What qualities? Uh, I mean, just the list of all the stuff that you have to do to start this. Like I'm exhausted just thinking <laughs> about all of those things that you had to do to get this thing created. So you obviously, you and your partner have a lot of energy. Uh, you guys obviously have that talent and that ability to not only be producers and musicians, but also flip the hat and become businessmen as well. Marketing, sales, you know, payroll, everything that you guys have to do on that side of it. That's why I think a lot of producers who um, just want to play music, just want to produce, mm -hmm. just want to focus on that creative side of the business, um, this usually wouldn't work out. Was there any other maybe qualities that you would see uh, in a producer that you would say probably not a good fit for you? Yeah, I think the first thing is you kind of have to, so the way I see it is um, 
to start a business like this, you it's one it's one of two things. You either have to be a business person yourself, you know, first. So the way I see it is, you know, if you have that mentality or if you have that in you to where you're a creative business person, this is something that, you know, that will fit you, right? But if you're a creative person that just wants to go into business, I'm not so sure, you know, because it might be more beneficial for you to just stay creative. Now, one way around that is to partner with a purely business person. And then you can have a deal where it's like, hey, listen, you take care of the business. I will supply you with all the creative stuff, you know, and some of the biggest companies have started that way, you know, um, so that could work, too. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it, it comes back down to sort of um, demand. And, you know, so if I see like if I see a composer that's just like cranking out great music and just loves to be in the studio and come up with new sounds, come up with new styles, and that's all they do, right? And then like, and I ask them the question, and it's like, okay, well, what do you want to do with this? And they give me the answer like, well, I don't know, anything's kind of cool with me, like whatever, <laughs> you know? Like, then I know for sure that's just like, okay, if they're gonna start a business, that's probably due to necessity, you know? It's like, they don't, they don't really want to, it's like, you know, so I think that's a thing. You have to want to get into this as because that's going to be a line that you're going to have to fight um, your entire way through is trying to figure out where to be creative, you know, because a lot of the time you're spending is like, you know, so I get up really early every morning. A lot of those mornings are spent um, just taking care of like um, my creative ideas, putting stuff down. And then I do that again late at night. But during business hours, it's all business. It's email after email, licensing searches. It's you know hitting up uh, people to par possibly partner with. It's selling, all that kind of stuff. You know, and if you're okay with that, and if that's something that's fun for you, and it's it's fun for me too to a degree, and you know I like doing that kind of stuff. Then yeah, great. You have the mindset for it. But if it's something where it's just like you know if it, if it starts to be tedious, you know, like try it for a week, and if it's kind of just like all right, you know what, I didn't get. I didn't quit my day job to get into music just to form another day job for myself. You know what I mean? Like, cause that's essentially what it is. It's just that, you know, you're working longer hours, money isn't guaranteed, <laughs> you know, it's a lot more stress in that way, you know? So you gotta, the biggest thing really is you just, I, both as a composer and as a business owner, you have to love what you do. And as a business owner, just try to do the research and understand everything that goes into it and see if you love it. You know, if you love it, great, go after it, you know, and if you don't, it's totally fine to be like, you know, like I said, there's enough money to go around to where it's like you can be, you know, you can be a smart composer getting good deals and make a living and, you know, and that's fine. You just create and just do what you do best. So. That's great. Yeah. And I want to finish the, the interview on that very note um, about having fun with it. Like you said, if you just if you, you know, again, if you want to start your own label, um, your own library, your own catalog, um, I would say definitely put zero money down. Don't invest or just very minimal. You know, maybe you just want to put a website together and kind of give a, a sort of like you said, uh, maybe a week or a month uh, trial at it. Do not invest thousands of dollars into something that you're not really sure it's really what you want to do um, and give it a shot. And if you find that the process of building the website structuring this um, researching who you're going to be pitching your music to um, you know emailing clients that kind of thing if you find that even in the beginning stages of z almost zero investment money wise uh, just a little bit of time if you're finding that you're enjoying that that's a great sign that this could be a, a very profitable future for you uh, if it's already pulling teeth within a couple of weeks then get out of it because it's the same thing with producing and making music if you're not having fun uh, being a part of this business just as a producer or composer, it also will not work out for you because you got to have fun. You got to find a way to have fun. Um, and if you do just enjoy the craft of making music, producing, mixing, and mastering music, and also constantly improving your skills. And, uh, you know, one of the things I love about producing music after all these years is creating something and hitting play later going like, I created that? Like, did that really come out of me? Like, that doesn't even sound like something I, I'm even capable of doing. Like, impressing yourself with what you're, what, with the skills that you You've been acquiring over the you know years months and years that you've been in this business that is one of the most like it's just an unmatched feeling to have competence at your craft 
to not just feel like you're an outsider with some subpar music. Oh, no, one of these days I'll get better. But actually seeing, you know, every single time you produce that these improvements are happening. Uh, and of course, the sort of big cherry on top where you get accepted by a library, you get paid for your music, you earn royalties, you see your track played on TV, you get the sense of purpose and value that you probably never have had in your music career up until you got really involved with sync licensing. At least I know for that for myself, spinning my wheels for years and years and years before I got into this, um, just chasing the coattails of other people and trying to just get a little bit nibble off of their success. Um, I just, I always felt like an outsider, uh, sort of a, a fraudulent imposer, you know, kind of coming mm -hmm. in and, and trying to pretend like I had some sort of value in the industry. But it wasn't until sync licensing that I really got that true value and that underscore of understanding how my music really serves a purpose on planet Earth. And it's not just ideas in my head, sitting on my hard drive, that's cool. You know, that's fun and that can be enjoyable to a certain extent, but it's a completely, it's a, it's another level when you actually partner and sign a contract and get paid yeah. and see your music being played in front of millions of people and knowing that your yeah. track actually did something to enhance somebody else's creative uh, idea or vision as well. So I think that's a great thing that we should end this interview on is just have fun, guys. If it's not fun, it's not the right fit for you. So that's a great piece of advice, I think, that Mike left. So Mike, thanks so much for your time today, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. And thanks for having me on the platform and everything too. Like I, you know, I think everything that you've built is incredible and it's great. And I wish, you know, like you've said before, like I wish 10, 15 years ago that there was something like this around, you know, there'd be a lot of missteps that I wouldn't have taken, you know, if there was information even, you know, that was structured and organized in the way that you've done it. So thank you. Yeah, and thanks to you because you're obviously a very, very uh, active member on in Sync Academy with your tutorials and all the wisdom. And if you guys are in Sync Academy, you guys have probably interacted with Mike many times. He's actually one of the first that when you guys have some great questions, he will come in with like literally a book of answers. Like this guy does not just like phone it in and type a couple of sentences. He will walk you through all of his insights and share with you guys all of his wisdom. He doesn't hold anything back. So I do appreciate you, Mike, being on the platform. I know all the members obviously get a lot of value from you being there. So that wraps it up for this week's episode, guys. I hope you enjoyed. Obviously, Mike will be back. We'll definitely do more episodes in the future. There are hundreds of topics that we can obviously dive into. And as you guys can see with this interview, Mike has a lot of insights and, um, and knowledge that he can share. So thank you guys so much for watching and we'll see you guys in next week's episode. Thank you for listening to the Sync My Music podcast. If you enjoyed the show and want me to do more episodes, all that I ask is that you leave me a review on whatever platform or app that you're listening to. It just takes a few seconds. I'll never charge for this podcast and I wanna keep it 100% ad free. And your review right now will help me do just that. Thank you so much.